405 in your hymnal, 405, a friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong and true. Let's all stand together as we sing 405. On that first together, a friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong and true. singing tonight good to see you back in church hope you had a wonderful afternoon yeah. looking forward to a good service together this evening let's open with prayer shall we father we bow before you tonight we thank you for a wonderful morning this morning thank you lord for meeting with us and thank you for a good afternoon and for the beautiful spring like day we got to enjoy and lord we're thankful for each one who's made their way here this evening lord i do want to pray for those unable to be here tonight because they're sick and under the weather and i pray god that you would Put your healing touch upon them, strengthen them, and they could be back with us by the midweek service. Now, Lord, we do bow before you and ask you to meet with us tonight. Pray that our hearts will be ready to receive what you have for each one of us and that uh, you'll help us to focus and to give you our undivided attention for the, the next hour or so uh, that you might speak to us and you might accomplish what you desire to in each one of our lives. Uh, Lord, mold us and make us and shape us. Put us on the potter's wheel tonight and mold us to be vessels of honor unto you and have your way in this service in jesus name amen, amen. all right you may be seated 333 in your hymnal 333 the lily of the valley i have found a friend in jesus he's everything to me he's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul the lily of the valley, in him alone I see All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay He tells me every care on him to roll Hallelujah, he's the lily of the valley The bright and morning star He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul he all my griefs have taken and all my sorrow born. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. 
I have all for him forsaken, and all my titles torn from my heart, and now he keeps me by his arm. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan damn me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. Hallelujah, he's a lily. up to glory, I'll see his blessed face. Hallelujah, he's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. All right, now this week we're right on schedule with everything as we turn the calendar tomorrow to February and uh, we're heading right on in through 2016 and uh, Tuesday night for Grove City School of the Bible and uh, that'll continue at 7 p.m. Tuesday night, Wednesday night for the midweek service uh, right back here in the auditorium, 2 Peter chapter 2. We'll begin 2 Peter chapter 2, Wednesday night. Uh, Thursday night, of course, is RU down at CRC, Central Reception Center. Uh, Friday, uh, are you right here at the church? We had 33 here Friday night, uh, just the adults, I think about 10 in the kids club and uh, I don't know, six or so in the nursery, almost 50 total that were here on Friday evening and a great night there. And then, of course, Saturday morning out at London, had a good good group of guys there and uh, soul winning and visitation, 10 a.m. on Saturday. And then that'll lead us right back up to next Sunday again, which is I Love My Bible Sunday. Uh, bring your Bible to church. Um, I think you ought to carry your Bible to church. I think it's a testimony. Uh, you'd be amazed uh, who watches from our neighbors across the street. And uh, D.L. Moody used to say, if you carry your Bible to church and you walk a mile to church, you preach a sermon that's a mile long. Uh, something about carrying that book, you know. Uh, who was, uh, somebody was talking to me recently, and they were saying about how they grew up in a church, and I think it was a Catholic church, and they said one of the things was, nobody carries a Bible to church. And uh, if you ever observe churches at all, you, the, one of the things you look for is how many people are carrying Bibles and, uh, in the church. That kind of lets you know what kind of a church it is. And uh, I think it's a good testimony to carry your Bible. And so uh, everybody ought to bring a Bible to church. Good. Four of us think so. Everybody ought to bring a Bible to church and uh, bring your book with you, all right? And uh, we are people of the book. So uh, we'll talk about I Love My Bible Sunday. Next Sunday, bring your coin folders in. Uh, hopefully you filled those up, and uh, there's still a few more back there if you want to uh, get some and uh, get your quarters, get your change, and uh, bring those in, and we'll have a special collection of those and, uh, and an offering as well if you want to give uh, over and above whatever the quarters are uh, to go for Bible publishing, okay? Getting the seed to be sown among those who need it, amen? So we're excited about that. Well, look around to see if anybody's visiting tonight. Anybody here tonight? for the first time. I don't think I see any first timers. So let's take a minute. We'll hear from the choir.
249, <coughs> excuse me, 249, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. 249, let's sing that first together. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. With life from above into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace, it is proper. He saved me, oh, praise his new name. Heaven came down and glory filled. My soul, when at the cross a Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to <coughs> and glory filled my soul. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in the mansion sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Rich and eternal and blessing supernal from his riches and I receive. Heaven came down. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Heaven came down. good let's go over to 91 91 what a day what a glorious day that will be let's all stand together number 91 on that first all together there is coming a day when no heartache shall come no more clouds in the sky no more tears to dim the eye all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who said, What a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
as I shall see when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear. Let's sing that last together. When we get to the chorus, we'll have the instruments drop out. On that last, there'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parching over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, no one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. All right, you can be seated. As they say, if that doesn't bless you, your blesser is busted. But uh, that's great. Great singing tonight. Amen. All right. Ushers are here, ready to receive the offering tonight. Let's give as God has blessed us and prospered us, and we'll pray. Ask God's blessing on the offering. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful to be in your house tonight. Thank you for the songs that we get to sing and just reminded of how great a Savior you are and our future home that you're building for us. And Lord, thank you so much for your goodness to us. And Father, now we get a chance, an opportunity again to give back to you of all that you give to us. Help us to be cheerful in our giving, knowing that what we give is for eternity. Lord, be with us now as we get ready for the preaching of God's word. Open our hearts and speak to us, Father, and we'll thank you for it. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, and turn to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, please, 
for our scripture reading, Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 3 through 12, verses 3 through 12 of Ephesians chapter 1. Reading them responsibly as we normally do. Beginning together on verse number 3. And once you have that, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 3 of Ephesians chapter 1. Ready? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And let's finish with 12 together also. That we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. And let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer this evening now. We thank you, Lord, for your word, and thank you for the Bible tonight. And Lord, we're asking you to continue to make our hearts ready uh, to receive your word this evening, that our, word, that our hearts would be fertile ground and good ground that the word of God can fall into and bring forth fruit in our life. Uh, Father, I pray your blessing on the special, and I pray that it would help us to tune our hearts to thee. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. The angry men were closing in. Rocks were in their hands, a decent payment for her sin. Now her life must end. But Jesus said, let he who's innocent cast your stone today. I wasn't there to see her face, but I can almost hear her say, merciful to me, when I deserve to die, merciful to me, my soul he brought new life, Not Satan's men were closing in. I knew what was in store. A decent payment for my sin, eternal fire and more. But Jesus said, I have an announcement I'd like to make today. scars to prove that I've taken this 
Father, we bow before you in prayer now this evening. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy to us. Thank you for all the blessings that you give us. Lord, help us to realize tonight just how blessed we are. I pray you'd honor the Word of God as we look into it this evening. Please open our understanding as we look at it together tonight. And I pray, Lord, that each of us would bless you for all that you've done for us and all the things that we have that sometimes we do not realize we have, we take for granted for what we have. And Lord, I pray that you'd open our understanding tonight and, and help our hearts to overflow in praise to you and your goodness to us. So help us as we look into the scripture here this evening. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. As we <clears throat> read Ephesians chapter 1 this evening, is there a light go out? Oh. Who was that? Don Taylor? What? When he walked by, did he hit it? He hit it? Yeah, he did. Okay, all right. You had no idea, did you? No idea. It's all right. That's all the light. <laughs> Anyone else want to testify this evening? All right, all right. In Ephesians chapter 1, as you look at the passage here that we read tonight, it's, uh, it's, if you're not careful, you just kind of look at it as the introduction to a letter to the church at Ephesus. But it really is an amazing passage of Scripture, the, really the entire first chapter. Um, in fact, it's, it's uh, the Spirit of God as He gives this to Paul. I wonder if Paul had the, the same thought as he begins to pin these words. If you notice... Uh, beginning in verse number 3, uh, you have a period at the end of verse 6, and then you don't have another period till the end of verse 12, and then you don't have another one till the end of the chapter. Basically, that whole chapter is like three sentences. Uh, colons, commas, and, and, and it's got to be just an exciting uh, passage as, as Paul pens these words and begins to realize all that God uh, is telling them and he gets to tell the Ephesians about what God has done for him. And remember, he's pinning these words from prison. And so that had to be another exciting thing for Paul to realize. If everybody, He's realizing here that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now you think about pinning that and it's one thing to pin that when you're sitting in a heated or air-conditioned home or you're sitting in a heated or air-conditioned church on a padded seat and you have a nice car or vehicle that got you to church and you're going home to you know, a, a nice place where you can sit down in a, in a padded chair of some kind and, and relax and you can go to sleep in a bed. and uh, it, It's quite a different story when you're sitting in a prison like Paul was sitting in. And it's not sitting in prisons like we know prisons today. And uh, there were times that he was simply in, a, in basically a hole in the ground. And uh, there he was, and he gets to pin these words, uh, that God's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. 
What an amazing thing as Paul begins to pen those words. Blessed be God and the Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and, and who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And by the way, before he, we start talking about His blessings to us, Paul said we ought to take time to bless God. We ought to take time to praise Him and to uh, realize that He's blessed us and He's favored us and, and included not just eternal life, but all sorts of spiritual blessings. And we're going to look at those this evening as we look at this thing about I am blessed. God desires that we not just have better lives on earth, though by, I believe the life of a Christian is the best life on earth you can have. I think that's true. I think that it's not just, uh, we're not just living for the sweet by and by. Uh, it's good in the now and now too. It really is. If, if there were no heaven and there were no uh, uh, streets that she played the offertory about that will uh, walk one day, if there was nothing like that, if there was no one day seeing Jesus where he would take me by the hand and lead me through the promised land, hey, I'd still want to live a Christian life just because it's that good. Uh, I wouldn't want to live any other way. I enjoy living for God. So he's understanding these Christians are having a difficult time as well on earth and they were struggling and they were under some persecution and so he reminds them of the spiritual blessings they have in Christ Jesus. Let's look at some of those this evening, shall we? Verse number 4, he says, According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. The first blessing is the blessing of holiness. The blessing of holiness. And by the way, it is God that makes us holy, not ourselves. Okay? Uh, holy is set apart. Holy is the same root word as we get our word saints. And uh, it is God that makes you a saint. Okay? Uh, when you get saved, you're called a saint. Okay? That's a saint, uh, saint Reed that led the music this evening. All right? And, um, I, and Saint Yoder just laughed at him. But um, we're, you're saints. Saints not somebody in a stained glass window somewhere. All right? Saints are those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, that's called you're separated unto God. And uh, God says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. He made us set apart. He made us morally blameless. He's, he's chosen us to be in Him, and He's chosen us to be holy. You can't get that on your own. There's nothing about us as a natural man, as an unsaved man, that we can claim holiness before God. That has to be a work of God and a gift of God. Why? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none that are righteous, no, not one. So none of us could ever be holy. None of us could ever be accepted uh, by God. And, and we have to be born again. We have to have a new birth. We have to get a new nature. And with that new nature comes a holy life. And He gives us the ability to do that. And so, we're, we're, listen, we, we're not going to be holy. We are holy. That is, that is the blessing that God has given to us. That is already present. That is already a, a blessing that has been bestowed to us. Now, our, what we need to do is we need to ask God to make that blessing a reality in our life. Let's live up to our spiritual blessing. And let's be holy in all manner of conversation. And that is asking God to help us to be morally pure and set apart to Him in holiness. And He desires that we do that. Now that's difficult because we have a society that we live on our feelings. And, and I don't feel very holy sometimes. Okay, I know you probably always do. But I don't always feel that way. And, and we tend to go on our feelings. Sometimes people say, well, I just don't feel very saved. Or I don't feel like going to church. Or I don't feel like reading my Bible. And oftentimes we, we're so prone to go on our feelings instead of go on the facts. God said, I'm holy. Whether I feel like holiness or not, I'm to live holy. Whether I feel like doing what I should do, I'm to do what I'm supposed to do. We don't go on our feeling, we go on the fact. And so, that's by the way, that's called living by faith and not by sight. 
living by faith and not by feeling. Okay, Living by faith by taking God at His word and not by what we feel like. That's why I shared with the class tonight in the 530 class about when you lead a soul to Christ, when you lead someone to faith in Christ, the very first question you ask after they receive Christ their Savior, you don't look at them and say, well, how do you feel? You know why? I don't care how you feel. You did what the Bible said to do to know you're on your way to heaven. Okay. Now, when I prayed and I asked Christ to be my Savior, I was just a six-year-old boy, but there was a peace and a joy in my heart. And I knew God did something. Okay. But, I, but listen, I'm not saved because I felt something. That's, that's great that I felt something. I'm glad I felt something. But I'm not relying on a feeling. I'm relying on the fact I called on the Lord Jesus and asked Him to save me. And God said if I did that and I was sincere in my heart and I believed in my heart, then He would save me. And, and I did my part and I know God did His part. Whether I feel like it or not. We live by faith and not by feeling. And so the more you believe and you trust God that He's made you holy, He's given you the divine power to live holy, you will begin to live holy. You will begin to live differently than if you're not. So, I made you holy, God says, now trust me and act like you believe me. That I have made you holy and you have the ability to live holy. So we have the blessing of holiness. And by the way, it's rather important. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So it's a rather important thing. So the blessing of holiness. Then, number two, look at verse number five. Having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. The second blessing, and this may shock some of you, but it's predestination. Now, there's a lot of confusion about that and, and a lot of disagreement about that and just exactly what predestination is. Uh, verse 4 says that He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. So He's chosen us that we would be holy and we would be blameless. And in verse 5, it says He's predestinated us for the adoption as children through Jesus Christ, or through Christ Jesus. That predestined is not talking as some Calvinist would want you to believe that God chose certain ones to be saved and certain ones to be damned. That God says, okay, yes to you, no to you, no to you, no to you, yes to you, and God just chose people that way. That's not what that verse is teaching. Is now, I'm not saying, listen, nobody here would argue that the, the, the all-knowing God absolutely knows who will receive Him and who will not. That's the foreknowledge of God. God knows everything. And so He knows who will receive Him and who won't, but He does not interfere with the free will of man. And He allows man to make the choice. And, and God, does, God says He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is saying that He will that, that all men will be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth in 2 Timothy. And so we understand then, then to say that God says He created some to be damned to hell forever and some that would be saved goes against the very character of God. It goes against those verses that say He's... He wants all men to be saved and all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. That can't be true if he's already predetermined that some are going to die and go to hell. It cannot be true. And so salvation has to be open to everyone. And God is, God is not going to take pleasure in creating someone that has no opportunity whatsoever to receive His Son as their Savior. That goes against the very nature of God, the love of God, and God is love, 1 John 4, 8. And so God's not just going to love a select few. In fact, the Scripture makes it clear, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And so based on what we know about God from all of Scripture, this predestination has to do with the process of redemption. The process of being adopted by children or of children by Christ to Himself. That was predetermined by God that that's how we would be brought into the family of God. 
That, that was the plan of God from the, before the foundation of the world. Look over at Romans chapter 8, would you please? Turn back to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, 28, most everybody knows. Most people can quote it. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. But look at verse 29. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. It didn't say predestinated you to be, go to heaven or go to hell. He's predestinated you to be conformed to the image of His Son that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. And whom He called, He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified. Did you get that? He predestinated. In other words, it's, it's not predestinated to be saved. It's predestinated on how we will live after we're saved. That's the predestination. It's very interesting that those who, those who want to say that it's predestinated that I would be saved, they don't say anything about how they ought to live after they're saved. Uh, in the Bible, it says more about how to live after we're saved than it does anything about trying to God has pick and chose who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. And so there's a, it's a wonderful thing. I'm glad. Listen, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. That was the plan of God predestinated before the foundation of the world that that would be the redemption of mankind. Listen, this, this uh, Mormon theology that teaches that, that uh, when man sinned, God didn't know what to do. By the way, that's... that's that, that right there ought to throw up a flag. Okay? And so, so they believe, and by the way, this is Mormon doctrine. You look it up. You check it out. They believe God had two sons, two created beings, Lucifer and Jesus. And they came to, Je they came to God with their plan of redemption for the world. And, and God accepted Jesus' plan, and that was to come and die on the cross as a payment for our sin. He rejected Lucifer's plan for redemption and that's when Lucifer got angry and got mad and got kicked out of heaven. Now there's, there's all kinds of theological problems with that but one of it is, number one, God didn't know what to do. Think about that. God, God had the plan from before the foundation of the world. He knew exactly how man would be saved. Number two, the fact that Jesus and Lucifer are brothers, we got a real problem with that. And so, listen, if that's the Jesus that they trust, if that's the Jesus that they're putting their faith in, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. That's not the same Jesus we're talking about. And so when Mormons are trying to push for to be included in mainstream Christianity, you better stand up and say, no, sir, you can't be included in mainstream Christianity. Not only because you don't believe in the Jesus Christ of this Bible, who is God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and you don't even believe in this book. They believe in extra revelation outside of this book. We covered that on Wednesday night. This is the more sure word of prophecy, and you don't add to it, you don't take away from it. That wasn't in here, but somebody must have needed that. All right? The blessing of holiness, the blessing of predestination. Number three, the blessing of adoption. Go back to verse number five again. We talked about that blessing of adoption, the predestination under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself. Again, the, the, this refers more to the process of adoption than the, the fact that the Lord chooses anybody who He's going to adopt. But, uh, you know, a lot of people in these days, in our society that we live now, come from a home where there is no father there, or there is maybe no mother there, or they're being reared by grandparents. In fact, more, I think I read recently, there's, this is the first time in history that more children are growing up in homes without a father present than there are children in homes with a father present. And so it's an amazing thing here why this adoption is so huge. God is willing to adopt you into his family. It's not a big deal to give your inheritance and to give all you have to a, to a child that's been born to you. 
But to take that inheritance and take all that you have and give it to one who wasn't born to you, but you have embraced as a son and given him all the rights of someone who was born to you, that's an amazing thing. And that's what God's done for us. We weren't, we weren't in the picture. Okay? Uh, that was God and Israel. We got adopted in when they rejected Him. When He rejected Him, the Gospel came to us. And we get to receive the adoption. And, and, and no, by the way, no strings attached with that adoption. No strings attached. In fact, the Lord says, I'm adopting you and you're going to be my sons and my daughters by faith in Jesus Christ. And guess what? He said, there's no strings attached to that. If you don't behave or if you don't do what's right or you don't follow me, He says, I don't take the adoption away. You are my sons and you are my daughters adopted into my family and you're there forever. Never changes. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. He'll discipline His own. He has expectations of His own, but He never disowns us. We receive everything that the Son receives. Romans says we're heirs of God, but we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That's, I, I, can't, I can't grasp that hardly. That's an amazing, amazing statement. So what a blessing of being adopted into the family of God. And we're just like sons and just like daughters. And we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. The blessing of holiness, the blessing of predestination, the blessing of adoption. Look at the blessing of redemption. Verse 7, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Redemption literally means a ransom. It, it is being guilty and being convicted but being pardoned because the payment has been made. He allows Jesus, His Son, to pay our ransom, to take the, the sentence upon Himself, and even though He knows that we probably will offend Him again, but He will forgive again. Redemption. The purchase of God's favor by the death and suffering of Christ. It's the ransom of deliverance of sinners from the bondage of sin and the penalty of God's violated law by the atonement of Christ. That's redemption. He's redeemed us. He's, he's purchased us and paid the ransom and the ransom was the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why it says in whom we have redemption through His blood. That's the price of redemption. We, we understood this morning with Cain and Abel how important the blood was in acceptance of the sacrifice. So we have the blessing of redemption. I'm so glad I'm redeemed. I'm so glad He purchased me. He bought me back. We're not redeemed, as Peter said, by corruptible things like silver and gold from our vain conversation received by tradition from our fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Okay, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So I have the blessing of redemption. But then there's a fifth one, and notice it's the blessing of forgiveness. Not only redemption through His blood, but the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Here he differentiates between forgiveness and redemption. Redemption is that, that paying the, the price and paying the, the, the ransom, if you will. But forgiveness is a complete forgetting of anything that's happened. It is a, it's, 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 it's God saying you're never going to be held responsible for what you've been forgiven for. Wow. Never going to be mentioned again. There's no punishment. There's not even a mention again. Your sins and your iniquities, God said, will I remember no more. He never holds it against you. That's God's forgiveness. What a, what a blessing that is. You ever, you ever made, you ever done something wrong? I mean, I mean really messed up. I really hurt somebody. And, and maybe months go by, maybe years go by. And then somebody sees you and they bring up what you did all that many years ago. And it, 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 it hurts. It kind of opens it all up again for you. You say, oh Lord, I wish 
man, I wish I could just go back and take that away. I wish that never would have happened. But it's hard to get that brought up again. You know what's great? God never does that. God never does that. And by the way, we ought not to either. Because the Bible says we're to be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. That means when you forgive somebody, you also say, I too will choose not to remember your sins or your iniquities anymore. And we're not going to bring those up ever again. They're gone. That's how God treats us. What a blessing that is. What a joy that is. So another blessing we have. We have the blessing of holiness, the blessing of predestination, the blessing of adoption, the blessing of redemption, the blessing of forgiveness, and then look at number six, the blessing of grace. The blessing of grace according to the riches of His grace. Grace. Just as there's a separation between redemption and forgiveness, there's a differentiation between mercy and grace. Mercy will protect us from punishment, but grace completely wipes the offense away. Mercy can be shown without love, but grace is the epitome of love. The word for grace is charis, which means a gift. It's God's gift to us, His grace. That's why we sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Grace includes joy. Grace includes taking pleasure in the person you're giving grace to. And that's God. Now God doesn't just save us by grace. God gives us grace to live the Christian life. Grace is His gift to us. Grace has always been trying to define by different things and Somebody says it's, it's as a cross stick, it's God's riches at Christ's expense, and, and that's, that, that fits the GARCE real nice. But still, yeah, I've heard that growing up, and I always thought, I'm not sure what that means either. Are you with me? Huh? And that was all right, but, and that fit that acrostic real neat, and I wrote it in my Bible and everything, but uh, I wasn't sure that helped me. Several years ago, I was talking to, in fact, it was a fellow who, who was in our youth group, and he ended up being a pastor, and uh, he was saying, you know, I think grace is, he said, it's God's sufficiency for my insufficiency. I thought, you know what? I think that's pretty accurate. What's God's grace? His sufficiency, His power, His ability, if you will, for my inability. I'm unable to live for Him. I'm unable to please Him. How can we do it? We've got to have His help. And He gives us His grace. That's why Newton wrote, it's grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. It's grace. Look at Titus chapter 2. Go to your right now after Ephesians, uh, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians. Go to 1st, 2nd Timothy, and right after Timothy, 2nd Timothy, you'll find Titus. And look at Titus chapter 2, would you please? Titus chapter 2. The Bible says, notice verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Hey, what teaches us that we can deny ungodliness, we can deny worldly lusts, we can live soberly, righteous, and godly in this present world? What is it that teaches us that? God's grace. God's grace. His ability. How can I? So I just can't help it. I just do it. You're right. You can't help it. You've got to ask God for His help. And He will give you the power to do it. He'll give you His grace. When you, it's by His grace, He'll get all the credit, not you. That's how you deny worldliness and you deny... Uh, uh, worldly lusts and ungodliness and you live sober, seriously, seriously and righteously and godly in this present world by the grace of God. What did Paul say? Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And Listen, if you live for God and you accomplish anything for God, it's by the grace of God we do what we do. 
His grace. What a gift. Not only forgives us, not only brings salvation to us, but it trains us, it empowers us, and it guides us through this life. So we have the blessing of grace. And then number seven, go back to Ephesians chapter one. I only have 67 blessings. But <laughs> number seven, the blessings, the blessing of being sealed. Look at verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. This has a lot to do with what kings used to do when they would put their stamp on things to authenticate something. In fact, uh, Brenda sent me a link of recently archaeologists just uncovered the ring of Hezekiah uh, in an archaeological discovery. And they, they, they were able to magnify the, the signet on the front and it says uh, the Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, on the ring. And it was his ring that he sealed and they, they've uncovered that now. Uh, over in the Holy Land. And uh, it's, it's an amazing thing. And so they, uh, a king would, would put that ring into the seal, of, of usually made of some wax and such, and it would harden there. And once that was in, it couldn't be reversed. That's why in Daniel, we talked about Daniel this morning, and when that king sealed that with his signet, it couldn't be unsealed. That's why when Esther and Mordecai, when the, when the king delivered the decree that Haman got him to sign, the death to all the Jews, it was sealed with the king's seal. And you can't reverse that. All he could do was issue a second decree and seal it and send it out. But if people didn't get the word of the second decree, they would carry out the first one. And so it had to be important to get that out. But they couldn't change it. You couldn't alter it. It was, it was uh, impossible to do. And so it was a seal. And here, it's interesting. Remember in the book of Revelation, those who worship the beast, they, put a, they got a seal or a sign in their forehead or their hand. The 666 number. You remember the, those who follow God, the 144,000 that are, that are going to be sealed by God. They're sealed with a seal in their forehead. Some indication that everybody's going to know that they belong to Him. And listen, here in Ephesians, he says, the mark, listen, the seal or the mark that we have to let everybody know that we belong to God is the Holy Spirit of God. He's the seal of God in each one of our lives. It's not a physical, visible mark, but it certainly ought to be noticeable. It certainly ought to be seen that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in us. And, and it's, it's identified as... The, it's interesting, the seal of man is, is on his head and on his hand. And it has to do with your thoughts and your actions. The Holy Spirit of God ought to affect our thoughts and our actions. And ought to be evident then for everybody to see the effect the Holy Spirit has in our life. And so when the Holy Spirit puts a seal of authenticity on someone who's truly born again, and He enters into us, and we, our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we're sealed to the praise of His glory. Look at verse 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession... The, the final redeeming of the purchased possession, which is our body. That'll happen at the rapture. That'll happen when we go to be with the Lord. And unto the praise of His glory. And so, the, so once you're saved, you are always saved. Once you're saved, you cannot be unsaved. Once, it's not a matter of whether you can lose your salvation. The real matter is, can Jesus lose a soul that has been entrusted to Him? That's the question. Can Jesus lose a soul that's been entrusted to Him? And the answer is, no, He cannot. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that's been given to us and has been sealed with the, the seal of the King, which is the Holy Spirit of God. He bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Well, I'm blessed. <laughs> These are great blessings we have. Now let me share some things that aren't in Ephesians 1 just by way of a testimony, okay? 
birthdays are always times of reflection. I think they should be anyway. What has happened and what has yet to happen or what may happen. And I spent some time reflecting the last few days and, and uh, I just want to testify that I, I'm blessed. You know, I'm blessed by, I, I got to think it, I'm, I'm blessed by faith, my faith in Christ. I'm, I'm so thankful that I got saved at six years of age. I began reading the Bible when I was six. I remember clearly, just as if it was yesterday. And of course, it wasn't that many years ago, of course. (laughs) Thank you, Don. Give you your money after church. (laughs) And I would say I, I probably became more of a student of the Bible at about 16 years of age got serious about knowing what the Bible said and, and really I, it was through Canton Baptist Temple and Rod Stuchel, some of you have heard me talk about Rod and he really took me under his wing and he started taking me to a Thursday night Bible discussion at the activities building uh, with Mel Sabaka and uh, people just I, I don't know, I, I think anywhere from 50 to 100 or more, more college and career age kids and I, I'm going there at 16 years of age, but uh, Rob was a couple years older than I, and I just went with him, and 8 o'clock to 11 o'clock every Thursday night, and, 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 and sometimes 100 or more would, would all around tables in that activities room and, and, and building, and, and Mel Sabaka would be there just kind of to moderate, but they had all kinds of people come in, they had Jehovah's Witnesses come in, and they had different cult groups come in, and atheists come in, and they would ask questions, and Mel would not answer, he'd say, okay, who's going to answer it? And he'd let those guys use the Bible. He'd have his own young people use the Bible. And, and, and man, I learned so much. And uh, began to understand and study the Bible because of those times. I'm, I'm thankful that just as a young boy, my dad got a paper coming to our house called The Sword of the Lord. And uh, Dr. John R. Rice started that paper in 1934. And uh, still a great paper. And I got to... I became acquainted with Dr. John R. Rice and his brother Bill Rice and Lee Robertson and Lester Roloff and Tom Malone and Jack Hiles and, 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 I, and, and those were, those were common, common names to me growing up and uh, reading their sermons in the Sword of the Lord. My dad used to have the radio on on Sunday mornings. I'll never forget it. He'd be in the bathroom shaving and he had the radio on. And it would always be the program out of Hammond, Indiana. And it was Let's Go Soul Winning with Jack Hiles. And all it was every week on his program was he'd interview someone who'd gotten saved that week and, and was there at church or recently had gotten saved and gotten baptized. And he'd just interview them about their salvation experience. And I grew up hearing that. Those men, along with Dr. Harold Henniger, really, really shaped and influenced my life. I was blessed to, to be in a church at that time, Canton Baptist Temple, that really challenged young people to serve God with their life. They challenged young people to surrender their life to God. When I surrendered to, to do whatever God wanted me to do and I went to a Christian college, we had 27 young people from our church at that college. It was just a, it's just kind of what you did. And, and, and you really wanted to do something for God. It was a great thing. And had a great camp. You've heard me talk about Camp Choff. You met Frank Wilson a, a few months ago. Well, maybe it's almost a year ago now, I think, that he came through and, uh, or last summer, I think, on his way up to um, North Dakota to the college there. And he's the one who got saved at Camp Choff. And now he's uh, full-time at a Bible college up in North Dakota. It's a... Uh, Wonderful opportunity that we had to serve the Lord there. I was blessed to turn, attend a Bible college and training at House Anderson that taught me how to be a soul winner. Taught me how to lead people to Christ. The other, it's, it's, it's amazing how we were talking about it in our 530 class. Uh, we had, we had uh, what did we have in that class tonight? How many? Eight? Yeah, there was eight. And we talked about how if, if those eight 
would win one person to Christ in the next year. 52 weeks, just win one, get him in church, get see him baptized, and see him faithfully come. Just one. Then on January 31st of 2017, we'd have 16 in the room. And then if everyone repeated that in the next year, January 31st of 2018, then we would have 32. And we, we determined by January of 22, 2022, we'd have 1,026 in that room. Now, we wouldn't be in that room, but uh, that's six years. Six years, we'd go from, from eight to over 1,000 just by each person winning one in 52 weeks, seeing them baptized, seeing them come to church. That's, that's how God designed it to be. You say, well, how come we don't see that? Because 95% of Christians never witnessed anybody else about Jesus Christ. That's what you get when only 5% of the people are witnessing. So I'm thankful I learned, I learned how to witness to folks. I learned how to give the gospel to people and to see people receive Christ as their Savior. I'm blessed to, through the years to have many godly people who followed a, a young pastor who made a lot of youthful mistakes. They followed me anyway. I started pastoring when I was 24 years of age. Pastoring people that were more than twice my age. I don't know how they, I don't know how they did that. God had to do it. I'm thankful now to pastor people who love the Lord and, and follow the vision that, that, the, that the Lord gives me to give to you. So I'm blessed by my faith. I'm blessed by my family. I have an amazing wife. She's just perfect, a perfect help me to me and one who I enjoy serving the Lord with. She's as real and as genuine as they come. What you see is that's who she is. No, no airs about her at all. Three grown children, a son-in-law, a daughter-in-law, five grandchildren. And as I got to hear from all of them today, all of them were in church this morning. All of them want to serve the Lord. All of them want to please God with their life. And that's, that's a great blessing. I don't take, we don't take that for granted. I know many of you have the, the heartache that I see as we get into the, the fourth quarter of our ministry is people with grown children that don't serve God. That's, that's the biggest heartache I see people carry. And we're blessed. And then I'm blessed by friends. Not just, not just friends, but brothers. The Bible says a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. And I'm blessed by brothers and sisters who are there through all times, including adversity. And so I guess I'll jump the gun a little bit and just say I love my church. I'm blessed to be at Bible Baptist Church. And I don't know how many more years the Lord will give us to serve Him and give me to serve Him. Pastoring sometimes doesn't lend itself to a, a long life. And so I understand that. I don't know. If God gives me three score and ten, I've only got 12 more years to go. Hallelujah, I've got 12 to go then. If, I hope he'll give me 70. But whether he takes me by death or he takes me in the rapture, I'm blessed to serve until one of those two things happens. That's all I want to do. And then I just, and I want to live every day 
conscious of how blessed I am. There's many times when I went through Bible college, and some of you have ever been in that position, you'll, I, I longed to the day I could pastor. You know, it's, it's funny, you, when you grow up in church like I have, you, you've heard about the return of Christ for 50 years. You never know when it was going to be. It got, it got pretty hot there in the mid-70s. People thought that was it, you know. And I remember praying, Lord, just, just you know, I want to go to Bible college. And, I wanna, and, and then I remember praying, Lord, just let me get married. <laughs> now that's 36 years later, coming up on 37 this year. And then, then I just, Lord, just let me pastor. Just let me have a trip. Remember thinking in Bible college, boy, I just can't wait. And, and sometimes I've got to stop and remind myself, you know what, you're getting to do what you wanted to do back then. It's great to serve God. I'm, I'm blessed. And I just wanted to tell you that tonight. I love you all, and I'm blessed to be your pastor. Thank you. Let's pray. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the people in this room and for your goodness to Bible Baptist Church. Lord, thank you for your goodness to each of us as believers. You have blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And Lord, on top of that, most of us have many, many earthly blessings as well. Lord, maybe tonight we ought to take time to count our blessings. To name them one by one and maybe it will surprise us what the Lord has done. Lord, we want to bless you tonight. We want to thank you that we're such a blessed people. We love you. We thank you for what you've done for us. And giving us all blessings. All spiritual blessings. In Christ Jesus. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. In a moment I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. I just wondered tonight how many folks had say, Preacher, I, I realize tonight I too am blessed. I too am blessed. Sometimes I've been, I, you look at the wrong thing sometimes. We all do. We get our focus and looking at the wrong direction. And maybe tonight you realize again how blessed we are as children of God. And I wonder if you say, Preacher, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart tonight. And I want you to pray for me. I realized I too am blessed. Pastor, pray for me this evening. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. Amen. Hands across the auditorium. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, we'll pray. We'll have our invitation. The invitation probably would just be you, you come and bow or you can come use the front row if you can't kneel anymore. And maybe it just ought to be to just thank God for how blessed you are. Say, well, I didn't grow up in a family like yours, Pastor. Well, why don't you thank God that he adopted you into his? And that he's a father to you. Why don't you thank God for the blessing of forgiveness, redemption, sealing you with his spirit. Just thank him that you're not only an heir, you're a joint heir with Christ. If God's given you some of those earthly blessings that I talked about, You ought to thank Him for those. He's blessed us. Let's thank Him and bless Him. Heavenly Father, thank You for speaking to our hearts this evening. Thank You for blessing us far above what any of us deserve. Forgive us for so often just taking it for granted, not taking time to recount our blessings. Thank You for all the spiritual blessings You give us and And Father, so many earthly blessings that we oftentimes take for granted. Hear our prayer tonight as we give thanks to Thee and help us to be ever mindful and conscious of the blessings You give us each and every day. Have Your way now in this invitation and hear our prayer tonight. And I'll thank You for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist is going to play. As she plays the invitation, God has spoken to your heart. Respond to Him this evening, will you? That's right. 
Amen. Sing that with her now, will you? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and Father, we thank you for giving us so great salvation. We're blessed. And Father, we love you this evening, and we just want to tell you we're grateful for how you've blessed us, not only with all the spiritual blessings that we looked at this evening, just some in Ephesians chapter 1, but Lord, the earthly blessings you give us as well. It sure is a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. I love you, Lord. I pray your hand of blessing will continue upon our church and these people that are the church that are gathered here this evening. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Make us mindful of your presence as we leave this place. May others see Christ in our life this week. Use us to point others to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. No, don't do that. <laughs> it, it is, it is uh, Pastor's birthday on the day of amen. Sunday, so we can't not sing Happy Birthday. <clears throat> we can't not sing Happy Birthday. It's just, just the way it is. So, uh, whether you want it or not, you're gonna get it. All right. So let's sing Happy Birthday to Pastor tonight. All right. Happy birthday to you. And uh, we are truly blessed to have an amazing pastor. Um, and uh, we would like for uh, you all, if you would, to come to the fellowship hall. We would like to uh, uh, share in just a, a little something uh, to honor pastor uh, for his <coughs> St. Burton Day. And um, uh, so, but uh, that'll be right after we sing our closing 
song of it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing we know. Let's sing that together. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's a best thing I know. Christian, it's the best thing I know. 